Hello. So this is maternal newborn, and I'm going to break it into three parts. This is going to be part one, where we'll talk about just basic anatomy, review, fertilization, pregnancy. Okay? All right. Very good. So the first slide uh, shows you the male and female reproductive organs. Okay? Um, I know that it seems silly to go over this, but I feel like we kind of should just really quickly. So when you look at the female reproductive organs, uh, and you can see where they are in the woman's body on the diagram, you can see that you've got the vagina, and then up at the top of the vagina, the mouth of the uterus is the cervix, which leads into the uterus. And then on either side, you've got an ovary, and ovaries are the female gonads. So that is where estrogen and female hormones are produced, mostly estrogen, and that is where your eggs are stored. So when you're born as a female, you have all the eggs that you're ever going to have. Women don't make eggs, they mature, okay? The eggs will just mature. But you have the number of eggs that you have the moment you are born. But then every month, once you reach menarche, in other words, once you start, you know, go through puberty and get your period, that's when every month, one egg, sometimes more, but typically one, will mature in alternating ovaries. So this month right, next month left, and the egg will pop out of the ovary and start making its way through the fallopian tube. And if mommy and daddy love each other very much, then the egg and the sperm, the lucky sperm, will meet in the fallopian tube, and that is where fertilization takes place, in the fallopian tube. Once that happens, then that little blast of cells will travel, if everything goes well, into the uterus to implant itself, okay? When we talk about fertilization, the male sperm, you either have an X or a Y, so dad decides whether it's a boy or a girl. The female, all of our eggs are Xs. Fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube. And with fertilization, you've got 46 total chromosomes. Just remember 23 and me. So dad gives 23, mom gives 23. Together, 46, okay? And when we start talking about newborn issues like Down syndrome and trisomies, you know, it'll make sense because there's a list of the chromosomes. It's number one, number two, number three, number four, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to number three. Down syndrome is a problem at the level of number 21 chromosome. There's an extra one. Anyway, okay. Implantation occurs somewhere around seven or eight days, oh, six to 10 days, I'm sorry, after fertilization. And the uh, union of the male and the female produces what's called a zygote. So that's what it's called first. And then it divides into that fertilized ovum as the cells start to divide. And then it's gonna turn into a baby at some point. With pregnancy, you should know, positive signs of pregnancy, ultrasound, Hearing the fetal heartbeat and fetal movement felt by the examiner, not by mom, okay? And that's usually not until about four months. Quickening, which is mom feeling fetal movement, is what we call presumptive sign of pregnancy. In other words, ah, seems like you're pregnant. Uh, and that occurs 16 to 19 weeks. You need to know good L sign, which is a probable sign of pregnancy, and that's a softening of the cervix. Chadwick sign, you need to know, probable sign, bluish coloration of the cervix, and then amenorrhea, which is no period. That's also a probable sign. They're not absolute, they're probable, okay? Okay, you gotta know Nagel's rule. That's how you estimate the date of delivery. You count three months back and add seven days, and just know during pregnancy, weight gain is 25 to 30 pounds. Even if mom is diabetic, it doesn't matter. She doesn't need to gain less weight because she's diabetic coming into the pregnancy, okay? We're not talking about gestational diabetes. Just know that all pregnant ladies should gain 25 to 30 pounds, okay? All right. When we're doing assessments, from the eighth week of gestation all the way up through delivery, that glob of cells is now a fetus. At 12 weeks, the fundus should be able to be felt at the top of the symphysis pubis. 20 weeks, right at the level of the umbilicus, 36 weeks, the fundus is right at the lower border of the rib cage, okay? You need to know those things. Premature neonate or baby is one born before the end of the 37th week. A normal pregnancy 
is anywhere from 38 to 42 weeks. When we say gravita, how many times has a woman been pregnant? If we say para, how many times did the pregnancy reach viability? In other words, did, did she carry that baby or that pregnancy through or above 20 weeks? Because 20 weeks of gestation is the age of viability, okay? Uh, I threw in a picture on slide eight uh, that shows the female reproductive anatomy. And this is important when we get the placenta previa and placenta abruptio. So there's the ovary, the egg is released. The egg and the sperm meet in the fallopian tube. And now that little glob of cells dee -dee 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 -dee, travels and implants itself into the uterus. If it doesn't implant itself in the upper two thirds of the uterus, there's going to be a problem. Okay. And that's where the placenta is going to develop. And if it's not in the right place, then we're going to have complications for that pregnancy. Okay. Painless vaginal bleeding around the last trimester usually indicates placenta previa and painful vaginal bleeding can indicate placenta abruptio or abruptio placenta. So if you look at slide 10, you'll see there are three pictures. You've got nice little fetus in there in the right position, head down, occipital, and you can see the umbilical cord and attached to the placenta and the placenta in the upper third of the uterus up top, right? The middle picture shows placental abruption or abruptio placenta, which means that the placenta is now ripped away partially or fully from the wall of the uterus. That's where the bleeding comes from. The third picture is placenta previa. Think about it, previa, previous. That means the placenta is before the baby, which is not supposed to be. And so the position of the baby, if the placenta is down in the lower portion of the uterus, and even this is the worst possible kind where the placenta is covering the cervix, as the fetus grows, the head is putting constant pressure on that placenta and could just cut off blood flow, oxygen, getting rid of waste, all the communication between that fetus and the mom goes through the placenta. If there's pressure like that on the placenta, it's not going to be working properly, okay? That's all I really want you to know and understand that, you know, with placenta previa, you know, mom's probably gonna wind up having um, a C-section. Same thing with abruptio, only with abruptio, it's like, we gotta do this now. That's usually an emergency. Pregnancy-induced hypertension, PIH, preeclampsia and eclampsia. I'm going to make this short and sweet, okay? For preeclampsia, that means that the mom has a new onset of hypertension and protein in her urine after 20 weeks of gestation. And this is for somebody who never had hypertension before. How do we diagnose it? 140 over 90 and protein urea that's greater than a plus three. Okay, so protein urea plus one, we're a little concerned. Plus two, we're, we're concerned. Plus three, she's in trouble. And then if we don't notice it or she doesn't get prenatal care and doesn't get treated, then she's going to wind up going into eclampsia, which is that seizures. She's going to start having seizures. Um, with eclampsia, here's what you need to know. There's a table here on slide 12 gives you different drugs. Really, if they're going to ask you about one of these drugs, it's going to be nifedipine. That's the most common one used to treat the high blood pressure. If she's having seizures, it's mag sulfate all the way. And with magnesium sulfate, remember, when you think magnesium and calcium, you think nerves. So the mag sulfate is going to stop the seizures. When you're assessing mom, a sign of mag toxicity is hyporeflexia or absent or depressed deep tendon reflexes. So when you check reflexes, you get nothing, you need to stop the mag, and you're gonna be giving the antidote, which is calcium gluconate, okay? Make sure that you know that with problem pregnancies, the best position that you can put the mom in is left lateral. When mom is laying on her left side, it's actually taking pressure off of the vena cava. So it, it tends to lower blood pressure, and it's also more comfortable. Supplemental oxygen can be given, and you know, make sure that she's, you know, you're ready to administer the mag sulfate in the event that she starts going into seizures. 
Um, we are going to pause here and I'm going to continue in one moment. I do want to talk about a couple more things with regard to pregnancy and some terms that you should know. So the word cloasma refers to, it's a mask-like appearance that happens like a hyperpigmentation on the face, usually happens across the bridge of the nose and the cheeks, right? Doesn't happen to all pregnant women, but it's, it's normal. Uh, the linea nigra, which is a line, a darkened line that goes from the umbilicus down to the mons pubis, um, usually appears during pregnancy, eh, late in pregnancy, um, but it disappears after mom has the baby. And then morning sickness versus hyperemesis gravidarum. Morning sickness is a feeling of nausea that happens usually upon rising. Very common, it's due to all these elevated hormones that are happening early in the pregnancy. Usually just the first trimester usually resolves itself. One of the best nursing interventions is have her keep just plain bland like saltine crackers at the bedside and nibble on a cracker before she gets out of bed, okay? Then there's hyperemesis gravidarum, which is extreme morning sickness. That's kind of all day sickness. Not common, but it does happen. And the woman is so nauseous that she is usually vomiting to the point where she's either not gaining weight or she's losing weight, which is even worse when you're pregnant, or she's becoming dehydrated or having an electrolyte imbalance because of the nausea and vomiting. So hyperemesis gravidarum can require IV fluid replacement electrolyte replacement. Um, it depends on the severity of it. So just be familiar with what it is. That's going to be it for part one. And I'm going to be moving on to labor, which is part two. Okay. See you in a few.